Uh, so, Jack, would you like to kick us off with a, a few oh. words, if that's OK? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, it's a little bit about Peabody, if you're not familiar with us. We're one of the oldest uh, housing associations in the country. Um, so we would say we are the oldest. Uh, currently, I'm part of our development team. We're delivering 25,000 homes per year in mixed-use developments. That's adding to uh, an existing portfolio of 55,000 residential uh, units that they date back to 1863. And, and I think that has quite a bit of relevance for BIM because yeah, our supply chain now can deliver it and we're looking at more innovative ways of doing that, but we have, it, it's not a facilities management approach. We are asset managers. We don't have people on site that will manage any particular dwelling. And there's no reason for us to do that because there, it's, it's passive management system, it's responsive. Um, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details about that, but one of the other things that um, I think is entirely relevant to the golden thread is a couple of numbers for you. There's 168 buildings with ACM within the social housing sphere that were affected by or that have ACM. And I know somebody who was involved with 44 of them doing pathology services and opening up the buildings. I was directly involved with eight uh, latent defect claims against contractors because the buildings that uh, I was uh, looking after for a previous um, employer, they had ACM, and not a single one of them had accurate records of what was on that building. The insulation was substituted. In many cases, the ACM uh, cladding material was also substituted. And there were discussions on whether that was legal or not with their lawyers, my lawyers, et cetera. And once I opened up the buildings, I had no um, problems proving latent defect claims because the workmanship was, in every case, appalling. So I think the, it, what worries me, uh, I think we, uh, the panel shared a couple of emails around, OK, what keeps you up at night? It's the things that the spotlight is no longer on. We're all looking at ACM. We're all aware of the golden thread. We're all talking about the exterior makeup of those buildings. But what I worry about is that, well, since about 2010, we have a dramatic increase in complexity in residential construction. And the things that we don't know that we don't know, like automatic opening vents, where are they in the buildings? What do we need to do to them uh, for a planned preventative maintenance Yes, Peabody is ahead of the curve. I think that, you know, I'm comfortable that my t asset management team has that under control. But as a sector, the information that we get from the supply chain is not reliable. I don't trust it. I just think about, you know, there's main contractors in the room. Gentlemen, ladies, I sometimes think about it's, I'm buying a used car from the guy down the pub who's bragging about how he knows how to disconnect the speedometer on that used car. And, um, and, and I, those 44 cases, that's proof, not reliable. So we're working on solutions, but I think I've had the microphone for a sufficient amount of time. Those are the things that worry me. Uh, those are the challenges out there. I think finally is that you know, BIM is a process. Digitalization is an enabler of that process. But what is missing, I think, is the, the, the people to populate that information that, you know, George has come up with a great solution, but if the supply chain from top to bottom is not updating that information, I can honestly say you having seen the whites of the eyes and some big money claims that the main contractor generally doesn't know what their subcontractor has put on their building that I bought. So that's the challenge for everybody. Um, I'll hand over the microphone to whoever would like to take uh, it. Uh, Andrew, would you, uh, Scott, sorry, Scott, would you like to, to, to go next? Um, yeah, follow, the, follow that. Um, it is a real challenge facing, facing our industry. Um, PRP are uh, a large multidisciplinary practice. Uh, we're housing specialists, so we're deeply connected to all the issues that uh, um, Jack has described. Um, Core discipline is, is architecture, but we also do a lot of consultancy work around fire safety, uh, and that is connecting us very directly to the type of investigations and, and reviews that Jack's described. 
Um, and as well as that, we're consulting with uh, MHCLG on Hackett Review and changes to billing regs. So we've got a very interesting insight on, on this problem being in it and, and looking at it to an extent from the, out, from the outside. Um, my role at PRP is focused on technical design and, and, and BIM. Um, and I think through that, um, my perspective uh, and ambition is really just about process improvement and projects. Um, and left, right and centre, I see so many opportunities for improvement, including within the consultant team, and including with architects and including, including our team. Um, and I'm really hungry to see the conversation around quality of information, clarity of brief, clarity of process and quality control delivered and become meaningful in, in our projects, which is why we're engaged on, on pilot projects, as, as you see here. Um, I do, though, think, and Jack, picking up on your last point, that the industry is massively challenged to uh, translate um, good process concepts into day-to-day uh, -day behavior and a new culture of quality and completeness for, for our sector. Thank you, thank you. Would Andrew, would you like yeah, to sorry. give a contractor's perspective? Yes, sorry. Um, my is Andrew Pryke. I'm Managing Director of BAM Design, part of the division of BAM. Uh, we are a main contractor, <laughs> so I can answer some questions there. But we're also property developers ourselves. We develop two or three uh, offices a, a year. We're now developing residential projects and high-rise residential projects. Um, we do design, which I lead up. We are a construction company. We're an FM company, and we occupy our own buildings. So there's a, an obvious uh, uh, need for the golden thread and data carrying through that. Um, we partner with uh, various digital uh, uh, companies. Um, and basically, what we've developed some time ago is very similar, and I, I uh, uh, applaud to George with the uh, active plan. Well, we, we worked on a system for the operation and maintenance for that gold, uh, golden thread. Uh, we retrofitted a, a hospital um, uh, that was built by BAM 10 years ago in traditional. No, no data, no information, exactly as Jack was saying. We retrofitted that with a model, retrofitted it with the data, went around photographing, pulling PDFs together. And I, I, some of you who work on hospitals will probably remember about three years ago, there was a major fire in a hospital, and therefore um, the, uh, the fire officers, et cetera, were coming around and inspecting all, all hospitals. They came to Wharfdale Hospital in Leeds, which is the hospital we worked on, asked for where's the, where, where are your fire dampers, et cetera, um, pulled out an iPad, highlighted where they were on the model, highlighted what they were, the manufacturer, when they were installed, when they were maintained, I took the photographs, and he said, well, let's have a look at one, and we went and actually inspected them, and they were exactly where they were. So, I mean, that's part of, it's, it's, it's a way towards that, and I think what, what uh, George is doing is, is, is part of that, that, that as well. But I think the key thing, and I think, again, Jack hit, hit the nail on the head, is I think whose role and responsibility is, and the capability, I think there is a big gap I think everybody's backing off their responsibilities. And unfortunately, as an architect, I think architects are to blame as well. Um, they're pulling out and not producing information. Um, and actually, I think the risk element and insurance, et cetera, is, is, is causing that. On the behalf of the supply chain and supporting them, I think there was a, a earlier stated, well, where do they start? What do they do? How do they move off? Well, us as main contractors, we're joy we've joined up with Scanscreen and Kia to actually, we're not going to, uh, you know, it, it, um, teach everybody what to do and then everybody gains from that. I think the CIOB, et cetera, could join all contractors and actually support the supply chain. There's some good supply chain members producing information and good data. But I think the key thing is, and obviously Peabody are an enlightened client, most clients either are not interested in what the data is because they're going to sell the building straight on and who cares, or they don't really know what data they want. So. What we're, we're acting on is almost integrators, uh, bring our FM team as consultants on board and advising them what, what a client should need on day one, and therefore it can take it through. Because if you try to retrofit it, it's going to cost a lot of money. If you do it from day one, it doesn't cost a thing. So it's anti-understanding and not put the fear, fear of God into everybody as they go along. So on that note, I'll pass it back. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, great sort of summing up, really, of the challenges and, uh, in George's case, uh, some of the solutions. Um, I think what we all uh, appreciate is that to make the step change in improvements that sort of 
Judith um, Hackett has set out, that um, we need, I guess, the industry, those on site, uh, contractors, designers, you know, to embrace uh, the sentiment and the, the spirit of, of change as well. It can't be just a box ticking exercise, you know, because we wouldn't really make the improvements necessary. I'd just quite like to ask the panelists, um, do you think there's an appetite? Do you think there is a change of heart out there um, to, to make these step change improvements? I don't know whether you'd Sorry. like to, yeah. Yes, sorry. Um, yes, I, I, it's interesting because as I'm working on a, a major residential project at the moment and a client is talking about, well, it's a tall building. The regulations say you can do one stair. He's saying, I'm not having one stair. I'm sprinkling it. It's enlightened. And I think that's positive. I sit on a, a design review panel for a major borough in London. Uh, the panel often, often recently talk about, well, what are you doing post, you know, the post Hackett report, post Grenfell? And they're saying we're just complying with regs, that's all we need to do. And I think we all need to take responsibility and, and move on. And clients, the same. It's, 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 it's going to cost more, but you know, the cost of not doing it yeah. is, is, is not, not something we should consider. OK, does anyone else want to? Yeah, I, I can also comment on yeah. that. And uh, I, I enjoy working for Peabody. They're putting in, or we're putting in sprinklers well beyond regulation where we don't need to, but we're not to, you know, I can't say it's all their fault. Because <laughs> when we are asked what are your asset information requirements, we're not clear. Uh, what are your employer information requirements? We're not a good client in the BIM world. And it is one reason is that 55,000 unit portfolio that that asset management team mm. that you know if you compare it to an FM model they're on a skeleton crew there's a room full of people about this size that are managing that portfolio for compliance and then there's contractors cascaded down to that but it, when I'm speaking to those guys about BIM they're like we don't need that what do I need the 3D model for and the whole BIM universe speaks in this weird language that's just acronyms and it's not practical but we're dealing with a practical subject that has really important implications. Um, you know, so a big social housing provider that has some enlightened leadership has enabled me to you know, progress things. We're still behind the curve as a whole sector residential, in my opinion. So, um, but there is a will to make a change. And I think things are moving in the right direction. But fear is the motivator, yes. I think. And the looming regulatory regime. Well, I think we're going to see that. Is going to Fairly compel soon. people to move. I, 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 Thank you. I, I, a quick response would, I think, simply be to, to mirror, mirror that. The question is: Has the sentiment shifted? And I think it undoubtedly has across the board and across the spread of clients, whether that's RPs, um, developers, uh, build to rent sector. Um, I think the challenge is to be, get granular on the detail and what does change look like in terms of again process and, and uh, uh, data. Um, and the reality is, I think, Amri, you're absolutely right that a lot of this is motivated by some of the uh, very significant real risks that businesses are facing around reputational regulation and contractual uh, shift. So um, I think those different drivers, um, um, including perhaps specifically regulatory change in the year ahead, are, are going to force industry to, to shift. I'm just going to... Yeah. No, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say that um, to mirror what Richard Saxon was saying earlier, uh, it's interesting that um, the first two reports said BIM in them and the, second one, the, the third one didn't. And I think that's a real step forward because um, I think if we keep talking about BIM, we're going to alienate a lot of the, the people um, it's actually about information management and the digital uh, implication of that is the key thing that we've got to drive. It's not just about 3D modeling. And I know we all know that, uh, but that is the way it's being communicated out to a lot of people. And in the asset management world, um, then they'll just switch off because they don't see that as being uh, a key driver. They want the information. Oh, I was just going to say, if I'm a member of the supply chain and I'm listening to some of this conversation, it all feels a bit theoretical. It's like, well, 
whose responsibility is it to do this thing? I, I know that I'm going to have a, if it's law, I'm going to have a contract that says I need to comply with laws. I think the real onus is on the owners and clients to be really clear in what they're asking for and understand that some of this is going to require them to look differently at the cost because some of these things will um, cost more in the short term. If they focus solely on construction costs, then um, doing a really all singing or dancing BIM model is, is probably going to, well, it's not probably, it is going to be slightly more expensive and sometimes slightly more expensive is all, is all that you need to make a difference between a yes and no answer, my experience. And they're going to have to move to looking at the whole life cost model much more clearly. And if you've got people, um, the example I think that was given by Andrew of people who are in and out, they're never going to do it, are they? Because they just don't have that that real driver. I mean, even in the world of PFIs where you think people would you know, really have that um, whole life cost approach because of the way they run their models. They're very, very tight, as anyone who's reading the press on being a PFI service provider knows. Um, actually, funds are pretty tight, aren't they, George? So, um, yeah. you know, even a, even the cost of producing a model which you know might save you money pretty quickly, is it can be quite prohibitive. Yes, and, and the... Yeah, the, the, the major thing with that with PFI is that what people do is transfer the risk. Uh, so what they're doing, the, the special purpose vehicle, um, which ostensibly is carrying the whole risk, um, actually tries to transfer it down to other organisations like an FM contractor. And, well, we know what happened with Carillion, but there's lots of other FM contractors that are really struggling at the moment uh, because they can't deliver the quality of service that they, they're expected to contractually, and they will just fail. Okay. Um, can I... Take questions from the floor. I'm sure there's lots. Uh, yeah, gentlemen there, please. And then we'll come to, to you. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to get you all to answer because I want to get through a few questions. So, yeah. Hi, uh, Dan Hollis from uh, Clarion Housing Group. Um, I suppose I, I wanted, wanted to ask a question about whether um, you think uh, clients have a responsibility, uh, a primary responsibility in terms of understanding the construction and the digitization of that construction, um, and then leading the, um, uh, the, the move to uh, a digital future, um, co rather than relying on uh, uh, consultants, contractors, um, architects to, to deliver that solution. Uh, Jack, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I, I think we have to, because why would they just do it? It's extra work. If we're not going to instruct it and pay for it, it won't happen. Um, but, but I do know that there are a lot of contractors that are worried about what's on their buildings that they've delivered, and they might feel a little bit differently, like they have to do that because I think one of the things that is rising quite precipitately is, is insurance costs. And insurers are asking practitioners, are you sure the building that you built is safe? And I got a letter from a contractor, and if I mentioned their name, you would say they said that they put a, something wrong on your building. Um, I was really surprised to get this letter that the high pressure laminate is in combination with that particular insulation is dangerous and we're gonna to have to do something about it. And it wasn't them who did it, it was somebody in their supply chain, probably their designers who said, our PI is online now, so we have to do something about it. So I think it's everybody, really, that's my opinion. We all have to step up our game. It's dangerous buildings out there. Okay, thank you. We're going to take a few more questions. Um, yes. Yeah, the gentleman there, sorry. thank you. Hi, sorry, I'm Steve O'Callaghan from MACE. Um, there's a couple of different aspects that I sort of wanted to raise, and the, the legal side of it is obviously a very interesting concept with the best evidence rule and whether or not all these digital platforms are going to be accepted in any type of litigation. But that sort of set aside, um, you know, recently the government stepped in and said all VAT returns, all sort of documentation from taxation, all have to be digital and through recognised platforms. And I suppose... Again, my, my attitude in listening to, especially the government people here today, is all this talk is sort of not going to happen. And I was very surprised after Grenfell that there wasn't more step in by the government because I worked out in Qatar, just as an example, 18 deaths in a, um, in a mall 
uh, of kids. And immediately you had the Qatar Civil Defense Authority was not only actioned, but building basically stopped. And they said, no, this is not going to continue. We're not going to have this. And the documentation process over there would shock you. The amount of, and, and I know it gets down to question and then the chartership of engineers and architects, but whether or not they're proven documentation or they're proven materials. But, you know, how does a panel so entrenched in the construction industry, what, where do we see our institutions, our, our institutions of civil engineers, the REBA, where are we enforcing the government to, you know, 3D modeling is a tool that the businesses should be enforcing. There is no add-on money to projects for that. That's the tool. It's the same as a power drill. It's the same as a, in my opinion, it makes you do your job more effectively. The digital management, to me, needs to be enforced by the government. You must record this information. You must record it in a certain way. You must actually record this. You know, I'm sorry to bring up particular projects, but Grenfell, prime example, deaths. I'm surprised that there hasn't been anything done. Bolts falling off buildings in the middle of London. If somebody had it died, I, I suspect that suddenly materials testing would have been queried. There would have been, you know, in Qatar again, they actually asked for mill test certificates for every bolt that goes on per thousand, etc. I just feel as though the UK is slipping behind by the government not enforcing things that they possibly should be forced by the, the people who they have chartered to hold that responsibility. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I, do you want to like to I think, back on that? I think the um, consultation I think is imminent. Yeah. I know you're I, closer I think, to it think, than me. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot going on behind the scenes, and I think we're going to see a consultation probably yeah. in the next couple of weeks. So watch out for some tough changes, I, I would say. You know, it's, the, it's a combination of carrot and stick. Everybody knows that there, there's a carrot, there's all sorts of benefits you can get, but, you know, you do kind of need the stick as well. Then I think the industry is going to need to be um, really clear with, um, you know, when this new regulations come out and, and everybody has to do things differently, the industry is probably going to need to be quite quick to respond on what that actually means in terms of pricing, program, process during the construction process. They're not going to be able to do that by themselves, are they? It's always going to be a two-way process. So I think we're going to need to be really quick to teach each other, if you like, what that's actually going to look like and also what's it, what's it going to cost. I think that's a really, really yeah. important one. Um, and that's it, that's just going to become an essential cost of doing business. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to try and take another question while we, because uh, there are a few. Yeah, yeah. gentlemen Hi. there, and then I think there's some there. Hi, my name is Paul Bamforth. I'm an independent consultant, and it's much an observation as a question, really, because in the last year I was involved in a survey of the whole of the industry around the adoption of digital object identifiers, which are used in other industries, which eventually will be embedded in the cladding. So you, you, you can be confident what's on the end building, not just in the model. But what I found very interesting in that survey where I surveyed architects, manufacturers, main contractors, clients, those who built and then sold, all of them can see. So the question, the answer to one of the questions was like, they can see that they should eventually do it. But the sad thing is they're waiting to be told they have to do it. Because the, mar the margins and the, nobody is taking responsibility at the moment during that, in my activity. So it was a case of there would be major manufacturers who would say, well, I'm not going to be the first who does this because I will have a cost associate with it. So, but one of the aspects was also the clients who would still hide behind the contractual arrangements that they have where they're passing the risks on. So it's difficult to do this without an element of the contractual element to change, and I think the legislation, so. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to come back? Scott? Or um, uh, I guess the first thoughts on that. The, um, I mean, maybe just pick up on the, on the, on the two questions. I, I appreciate the, um, Steve, your quick question about the dynamics between the pace of change um, and getting change right. And I think the whole industry has been wrestling with, with, with that. Um, the, um, the point about um, quality integrity of the digital information um, is well made too. Um, and I think experience tells us it's going to need to be regulated. 
um, and that's what's in sight through the vehicle of safety case review, uh, which will impose very clear obligations on the supply chain to provide certain information. Anyone else? Come in before we just quickly, up. I'm just going to say you've got a kind of perfect storm here of an industry where everybody knows that the procurement and the contracting model is, and I'm not going to be controversial when I say it's broken, it's widely accepted by all sides of the fence, it's broken, it's not really working particularly well for anyone. It's a really fragmented and complex market, even within the UK, um, so it's difficult to just solve it or kind of solve it across the piece. But what you've got now is you've got this perfect storm of kind of digital transformation and then this court of public opinion which is also really, really important in, in driving up the kind of reputational bit and the, has the kind of power to, to sort of push change maybe faster than it would do if you were only relying on the regulation. So I think it's a really interesting time. And I think certainly my sense is that um, the pace of change is in certain respects never been faster, actually. I can really feel it certainly from where I sit. And I'd, I'd like to think that I wasn't the only one who saw that. Very quickly, I think. Um People will need to be compelled, I think, and, and that is very close on the horizon. We will be seeing that consultation on the new shape of the regulations and the hoops that every developer is going to have to jump through to get approval for a building that is over 30 meters. There's a big debate on within MHCLG that I've just caught in snippets in the periphery of on whether or not it should be from 30 meters down to 18 meters. And my, I would, I, Personally, I think it should be at 18, but as a professional who would like to get things done and know what's practical, we're not ready to do 30 meters. And if we would just increase the scope of that to 18 meters, and this is just my personal opinion, we're setting an impossible task for ourselves. But it, it, eventually, at some point, the requirement, it, I anticipate the requirements that will be needed for the JCA to get to 30 meters. That's just going to become business as usual for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm being told to wrap up, so if you don't... I, if Andrew, just just one, one point, and I, I think it, 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 our, our own system, and I think George is, he may correct me, we're not talking components here, we're talking systems and testing systems, and I think that's the challenge in a sense. I, I remember from day one when I came into the industry, water testing various components, doing mock-ups, we're not necessarily having to physically test a uh, fire test uh, a system, but you look at the, as Richard says, the, the car industry, the aviation industry, they digitally test those now. They don't actually get an aeroplane and break the wings off. They test it. So maybe there's a system and we need to come out and comply and standards to, to work with that. So I think th th there's a way forward, but s somebody needs to, to take that lead. Um, thank you very much. I know. Uh, there are other questions, but I'm being asked to to wrap up, and it is a huge subject, and you know we are going to see real change. So uh, be interesting in a in a year's time when we reconvene to have this discussion. I think so. Um, please, uh, if you have got more questions, I'm sure our panelists are around over coffee, then you can ask them directly. But. Uh, before we do uh, have coffee, perhaps we could thank them all in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you.